The Saturn V Among the most famous rockets ever built, the Saturn V was the single largest and most powerful operational rocket ever launched. Hush SpaceX fans, Orbital Starship hasn't launched yet. At a towering height of 363 feet or 111 meters, the Saturn V was 58 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty and weighed 6.2 million pounds fully fueled for liftoff. It was launched a total of 13 times from Kennedy Space Center with a 100% success rate, and its primary use, which I'm sure you already know, was to put the first humans on the moon. However, in addition to being the mechanical face of the Apollo program, the Saturn V was also used to launch the first American space station, Skylab. We'll be covering both of these missions today. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. So, let's go over the structure of the rocket. The Saturn V is a three-stage super heavy lift launch vehicle. The first stage, called the S-1C, was powered by five F-1 engines fueled by refined petroleum-1 and LOX. The four outer F-1 engines could be hydraulically gimbaled to control the rocket, while the center engine was fixed. At launch, these engines produced 7.5 million pounds of thrust. The second stage, S2, used five J2 engines arranged like the five side on a die. This stage would use around 1 million pounds of force to accelerate the rocket through the upper atmosphere and into space. The third stage, S4B, used a single J2 rocket engine and was the only stage that was fired twice. Once to put the spacecraft into a parking orbit, and then again to put the craft on a trajectory to intercept the moon. In the case of Skylab, the S-4B was needed more to compensate for the increased weight of the payload and get it safely into orbit. There is more to the launch vehicle of the Apollo program, but since everything that comes after the third stage is considered a separate spacecraft from the Saturn V rocket, we'll cover that later on. For now, let's go to the Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A, where Apollo 11 sets atop the launch pad on July 24, 1969, at 12.32pm Universal Coordinated Time. At T-9 seconds, the five massive and powerful F-1 engines ignite, quickly coming to full power and creating a massive explosion beneath the rocket. At range zero, the hold down arms were released, followed by the umbilical disconnecting. The rocket lifted into the sky, its immense size requiring it to take a full eight seconds to rise clear of the launch tower. It would actually perform a small yaw maneuver to clear the launch tower safely before rising up past it. Let's watch the whole launch process in sequence, using audio from everyone's favorite Saturn V mission. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T-minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. 13 seconds into the launch, the rocket would perform a pitch and roll maneuver to align itself for orbit. Continuing up until two minutes into the flight, this maneuver is performed by the outer F-1 engines as well as the small fins above the engines, all of them performing tiny adjustments to keep the rocket on track. One minute and six seconds into launch, the Saturn V hits the speed of sound. 
1,234 kilometers per hour or 767 miles per hour. Vapor cones can be seen forming around the rocket from the intense speeds as it enters the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Unlike many rockets that throttle down to compensate for the structural stress on the vehicle at this point, the Saturn V simply bowls through Max-Q at full throttle, structurally sound enough to survive it without any difficulty. Two minutes and 15 seconds into launch, the center F1 engine would cut off, and 25 seconds later, the other four followed. Having carried the rocket about 68 kilometers or 42 miles into the air, the first stage is disconnected, and in a series of individual commands, the second stage is ignited and the hollow interstage is jettisoned, burned slightly by the exhaust of the second stage. Both the first stage and interstage would burn up in the Earth's atmosphere some seven minutes later. A few seconds into the second stage flight, the launch escape tower is jettisoned. This tower functioned similarly to the tower used by the Russian Soyuz rocket, and was never used on any Saturn V flight, so I won't go into too much detail. Suffice to say, this tower would have been used to pull the astronauts away from the rocket in the case of a major malfunction, but it was never needed, and at this altitude it was no longer effective, and so off it went. The second stage ended its flight similar to the first, cutting off the center engine at T plus 7 minutes and 40 seconds, with the other four flaming out 1 minute and 28 seconds later. It would then separate and the third stage would ignite a single engine, spending around two minutes putting the Apollo spacecraft into a parking orbit of just under 200 kilometers. While this is relatively low for an Earth orbit, the spacecraft will spend less than two revolutions at this altitude, making the decay from drag negligible. After confirming that the launch went according to plan, the third stage would reignite about two and a half hours into flight, increasing the apogee of the spacecraft's orbit until it would eventually intersect the moon. This burn would take only 350 seconds. Now on the way to their destination, the spacecraft would align itself for docking, and half an hour after the translunar injection burn, the command and service module disconnected from the third stage, within which was cradled the lunar exploration module. This occurred when the adapter panels were separated with explosive charges, setting the CSM loose to move itself forward a little, turn itself around, and then dock with the lunar module. These delicate movements were made using the spacecraft's small reactionary control thrusters that gave it full range of movement in the three-dimensional environment of space. After docking, the spacecraft itself doesn't do very much for a while. Several days, in fact. Due to the extremely high apogee of the adjusted orbit, the spacecraft slows down as it approaches that apogee. It heads out toward where the moon will be, continuing to slow down until it reaches a point where the Earth's gravity and the moon's gravity are roughly the same, a point called the equigravisphere. During these 60-odd hours of flight, the CSM-LM combo would slowly rotate on their roll axis. The reason for this was, since the spacecraft spent long periods of time with the bright unfiltered sunlight shining on it, to allow for even heat distribution across the entire vehicle instead of severely heating only one side, the Apollo astronauts compared it to a rotisserie cooker. Once the influence of the moon's gravity is strong enough to take advantage of, the CSM ignited its service propulsion system for a five minute burn to put the spacecraft into a lunar orbit. Five hours later it would perform a second, much shorter burn, circularizing its orbit around the moon. After ensuring everything was still working correctly, two astronauts would enter the lunar module, while one would remain aboard the command module. The two would undock and separate using their reactionary control thrusters. The lunar module would then use its descent module engine to bring it down toward the lunar surface. Once it came close to the surface, the lunar module had to hold altitude, hovering in place while attempting to obtain good radar data of the landing site. As a result, the LM was quite low on fuel by the time it finally touched down on the lunar surface. This is the reason why, after announcing they had successfully landed, Capcom reacted the way that they did. The landing was a lot closer than it seemed on television. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Heart control both auto descent and command override off. Engine arm off. Port 13 is in. We had shutdown. We copy you down, Eagle. Okay, everybody, uh, D1, stand by, D1. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. 
Roger Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. We all know what happens next. The astronauts exit the lunar module, do an EVA, plan a flag, talk to the president, arrange some surface experiments, and take some samples. 124 hours into the mission, after the astronauts had finished their job and reboarded the LM, it would jettison the descent module, leaving it behind as it rose above the lunar surface. It would then enter a rendezvous orbit with the command module, dock with it again, transfer all crew to the command module, and then disconnect the lunar module a final time. The fate of the LM was different for each mission. Some were sent into solar orbits, some were intentionally crashed into the moon, and some were left in lunar orbit. However, due to the moon's uneven distribution of mass, lunar orbits decay over time, and any lunar modules left in orbit would eventually impact the surface. The command module would fire once more to return the spacecraft to Earth, with it entering the atmosphere at hour 195. Splashdown would occur only 15 minutes later. Out of the entire monster of the Saturn V, this was the only part that would return to the surface of the Earth. So, what went different with Skylab? Well, basically everything after reaching orbit didn't happen. Instead, the immense power of the Saturn V was used to carry a space station into orbit. The first such station to be built by NASA, Skylab was actually a hollowed out Saturn V third stage fuel tank, converted into a large habitation and research module that remained in low Earth orbit for several years during the 1970s and was decommissioned in 1979. However, a lot of things went wrong during the launch and deployment resulting in severe damage to the station. Its micrometeoroid shield and sunshade were damaged, as well as one of its main solar panels. Debris from the MMOD shield became entangled in the remaining solar panel, preventing it from deploying all the way and leaving the station with a permanent and severe power deficit. Skylab was an honorable first attempt, and perhaps the Saturn V wasn't the best launch vehicle, but it did the job as best as it could, and it resulted in a lot of lessons learned for the later International Space Station. The Saturn V will never be matched. Although the SpaceX Starship now approaches its records when the numbers are run, there's something about the gigantic black and white Apollo rocket that will forever hold a place in humanity's heart. Something about the sheer power combined with the limited available technology, and all of that mixed together with the courage and professionalism of the Apollo astronauts themselves, is something we will never quite see again today. You know, few people are aware that the Saturn V's first stage originally only had four engines. The fifth was added in order to compensate for the weight of the astronauts' enormous balls. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys.